Welcome. Still in the morning of the first day of Wikimania, so everybody is looking fresh. We're going to kick it off with some audience participation. We'll keep it very light. Uh, first, welcome. This session is called the Policy Advocacy Showcase. So if you're in the wrong room, now is the time to leave. Uh, I'm going to start by holding the mic, obviously. I'm going to start with some basics. So if you'll indulge me, I will be speaking for a few minutes to kick us off before I hand it off to the wonderful panel you have in front of you. I'm Ziski Putz. I'm the Senior Movement Advocacy Manager from the Wikimedia Foundation. And I will be your facilitator. And I am joined by the movement members who do the actual policy advocacy work that we're going to be talking about today. So we have Eric Lut. Some may call him the Lord of the Creative Commons, but he is actually Project Manager for Involvement and Advocacy at Wikimedia Sweden. Does that sound right? Yes. Uh, we also have Lucy Crompton-Reed, Chief Executive of Wikimedia UK, Patricia Diaz-Rubio, Executive Director of Wikimedia Chile, and Mikola Kozlenko, Vice Chair of the Board of Wikimedia Ukraine. So maybe we can give them a little round of applause to get them excited. <laughs> All right, I'd like to get a really quick temperature check of who's in the audience, because I see quite a mix of faces. So maybe you could please raise your hand for me if you've never heard of public policy advocacy work at, that Wikimedians or the foundation are doing. Wow, OK, good for us. I think that's, that's a good sign. Now please raise your hand if you've, maybe you've been hearing about the term, but you don't really know what the work is that it refers to. Yes, I love the honesty. Thank you. That's why we're in this room. And now you've heard it all before and you can't get enough. Hands up high. Yes. All right. That's what we love. OK, so the goal of our session is very simple. We want to give you an advocacy 101 of what this work actually looks like within the Wikimedia movement, who's doing it, why they're doing it, how they're doing it, and also how we're going to plan on continuing to build this muscle in our movement. So I hope you walk away with some clear understandings. If you do not, if we don't cover what you hoped we would, please come corner me at any point in this conference or any of our speakers. So the basics, why we do policy advocacy in the Wikimedia movement, as many in this room know, the ability to freely access and contribute to knowledge online is not guaranteed. We face a lot of challenges that come from a hostile policy environment. Those can be things like, those can be barriers like government censorship, corporate or state surveillance, internet shutdowns, dis and misinformation, paywalls, and other barriers that prevent this kind of free access and contribution. So that's why the foundation and many of our members are actively trying to basically stop bad policies, policies we think are bad for access to free knowledge, and or promote ones that we think would be good for contributing to free knowledge. And we split our work roughly along five public policy priorities topics that we work on. And you can think of those as trying to promote policy environments that will protect the people of this movement. So that often comes down to things like privacy. We will try to do work that protects our values. So that tends to be work that falls into the buckets of human rights or countering disinformation. And we also try to do work that will protect our community-governed model. And those tend to be policies related to access to knowledge and freedom of expression. So in practice, what that looks like, some of our work this year includes combating mis- and disinformation around elections. As many of you know, it was a record-breaking year in terms of the amount of countries and publics that were going to the polls. Um, we also continue to lead by example as a top content hosting website by demonstrating what it means to take human rights really seriously by publishing a child's rights impact assessment and socializing some of our findings so that we and other platforms can try to do better. Uh, in Brazil, we worked with Wikimovimento Brasil and allies to improve language and copyright related bills. In the USA, we continued our campaign against Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which allows the US government to surveil individuals located outside of the US and also US residents. 
And we invested in providing affiliates with more funding, skills exchange, and opportunities to engage in this type of work. So that's things like finally making foundation grant funding available for public policy initiatives, supporting Wikimedians in attending regional policy conferences so they can network with important stakeholders and show off some of their work, organizing Let's Connect sessions that some of our speakers participated in, and trying to do a better job of compiling resources on MetaWiki and Commons, which I know people can appreciate is no small task. And finally, looking ahead, what's coming up for us? We are tracking complex legal requirements across a growing list of jurisdictions. Internet regulation is increasingly asking platforms or companies to carry out risk assessments and audits. It's not sexy work, but it's important and it's really time intensive. And this applies to all kinds of things like child protections, online safety, intermediary liability, and the hot topic of the day, AI. We continue to combat disinformation. This is a really big focus for us in the face of declining levels of public trust in information sources, which has also been influenced by tech developments like generative AI, notably. And we're monitoring punitive regulations that may criminalize online speech, the use of internet shutdowns, or other sort of tactics like throttling that might curb people's participation in holding their governments to account. This is important work that is quite, quite an array of topics, but the good news is it's a team effort, which is why I'll stop speaking, and I'm not up here alone. And I'm going to kick this off with a question to all of my panelists, maybe starting with Eric. Could I ask you to real quick just say your name? The superpower you think you bring to advocacy work, and maybe you can answer also in your experience, what's the unique perspective that Wikimedians can bring to policy discussions in your country context? Thanks, Ziski. And it, yes, it seems like this microphone is working. Uh, I'm Eric Luth, and as you said, I work for Wikimedia Sweden. I uh, also just want to say that I didn't name myself the Lord of the Creative Commons. It just we have witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if there, especially if there's anyone from Creative Commons in the, in the room. Um, <laughs> I also think that superpower is a very large word. I think that there's things that all of us can bring to, to advocacy, no matter where we are in the movement. Uh, but some of the things that I think that I can bring is partly like a quite a, a long... Um, um, I, I worked for quite a long time in politics, working as an assi a political assistant. I have quite a vast experience of how, politi how political and democratic processes work, which I think is really important when you try to do advocacy. When is a proposal fitting in time? When am I supposed to reach out to the members of the parliament? You know, having a basic understanding of, of timing, uh, which is, I think, if, if you come too late or too early, like no one will care about what, you, what you're saying. You need to understand the, 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 the right part of the process. I also think that, and I think that this is, you know, this is something that most Wikimedians would have as well, but quite a deep understanding of how intellectual property and copyright works. I've worked mostly with advocacy and copyright, and is this working better? Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, no, but like when, when I share some of the resources on Wikimedia Commons, like compiling and making overviews of copyright legislation across the world with, with lawyers, they get extremely impressed. But we have such a long, like long history of needing to compile, you know, what the legislative situation looks like in Paraguay or in in Sweden or in in Bolivia or or, or whatever, uh, and um, like having those practical exper experiences is something that politicians are really interested in, in hearing to my experience. So maybe like not superpowers, but what I can bring is insights on how politics and political processes work and, and practical experiences of where copyright is failing. And, and for where Wikipedia is needed, I think that uh, like there's a lot of, a lot of po politicians are really um, concerned about the development of the internet, about Meta and Google and large multinational corporations. So they really like when Wikipedia turns up because that kind of rem reminds them that there is something else. There is still parts of the internet which is free and open. Uh, and I think that there's, that's an area where we can actually become good and great allies and build alliances. Go ahead. Yep, uh, my turn. Right. I thought that your mic was not working well. But okay but from here i was hearing a little bit funny but it's okay 
Well, uh, my name is Patricia. I'm the, just like Siski said, I work for Wikimedia Chile and the executive director. Um, yeah, superpower is a strong word. <laughs> it's a strong concept. But if I have to choose one of my talents, maybe, <laughs> I'll say that communication, it's a very important piece on this a whole advocacy puzzle. I am a social communicator. I went to journalism school. That was the main thing that led me to work with the Wikimedia movement. I was dragged to work on advocacy. That's not necessarily what I, I signed for <laughs> when I started doing, when I started working for Wikimedia Chile. Um, yet I think that trying to explain what we do, the importance of the thing that we, that we do, the mm, the complexity of the Wikimedia movement, it's a challenge itself. Um, a lot of people know us because they relied on the quality of the content that uh, it's within our different projects, and that's wonderful. But the truth is that Wikimedia, it's way more than just the content that we share, we create, we produce, or we reuse uh, online. Wikimedia is a community, it's a philosophy, it's an ethos, it's a way to see things, it's a perspective about access to knowledge, uh, the freedom and, and also, um, not also the access to the knowledge, but also the possibility of people of using that knowledge, and knowledge is power. So, um, for me, I'll say that my contribution and something that at the end has been very, very, uh, I mean, it really passionates me, it's, it's that uh, challenge, how to explain that to people that not necessarily see what's beyond um, a particular platform, and that, of course, Wikimedia has nothing to do with Google, <laughs> Meta, or whatever you want to call it. Thank you. Oh, no, you have your mic? No. no okay. we, yeah, we share. Yes. Uh, yes. So, hello. My name is Mykola Kozlenko. I am vice chair of board of Wikimedia Ukraine, also an administrator of Ukrainian Wikipedia, and that's probably the superpower I'm bringing to the table, uh, because people are not to deny legitimacy to anybody else, <laughs> but people in like advocacy world are used to talking to project managers, to executive directors, advocacy coordinators, and so on. But when they see a volunteer, especially like a volunteer Wikipedia administrator showing up, they are saying like, oh, that's something new. We have not, we are not used to talking to this kind of people. And this is quite a big impact and which is something I also encourage all of you to do is if you want to bring from time to time at least some experienced Wikipedian to the room to talk about advocacy that really makes a change because for example there is a big topic about content moderation now in particular in European Union but also probably elsewhere and we as a movement bring a unique perspective of like community-based content moderation that not really many big platforms bring like there are administrators of facebook groups or like subreddits but that's like a smaller scale thing which is not as developed as our culture of administrating projects by communities in the wikimedia movement and i think this is something that lawmakers and partners are really willing to hear about about how we as like random people basically are good at moderating <laughs> one of the top 10 websites. So this is like the superpower most of us share in this room that we help keep our projects like working and being moderated and being in order by a bunch of volunteers. And this is a perspective that our advocacy partners really want to know about us. And this is also something that helps you sometimes open doors by saying, we want to share a perspective that like pretty much nobody else in the world has. So this also helps, for example, for us in Ukraine that we are saying, well, we already have some mechanisms that other people can learn from because we successfully maintain this platform for like 20 years, also in different challenging environments and saying like, we have a very unique environment, but we as a movement have some recipes to solve the problems. And we, of course, need help from lawmakers. We need help from uh, partners to be successful in it. But saying that, like, we already have some ideas that we need you to help us implement is something that really helps. Lucy? 
Thank you. I really love the idea of having recipes rather than models or products. So let's have some re more recipes. Um, hi, I'm Lucy Crompton Reed from Wikimedia UK. Um, I think my superpower, if I have one, um, is that I'm a straight talker, but I do it with a smile. Um, and I think the unique perspective and value that Wikimedia brings to these policy discussions is that we are for the public benefit and the public interest. We're not serving up profit for shareholders. We're not protecting rights holders although we do respect copyright, but we are there to serve the public interest and that is should be a, in a, alignment with whoever we're talking to in the policy sphere. Policy makers, politicians, parliamentarians, they are there to serve public benefit and so are we. Um, but I'll leave it there because I'm mindful of time. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so speaking of sharing what it actually means to moderate content on Wikipedia. And Mikola, you mentioned that you've been doing this for a long time and it's helped you open doors. At no moment in time are European officials specifically perhaps more interested in hearing how this actually works, especially if you're combating dis and misinformation campaigns than in a context like Ukraine right now. So maybe can you share how the work you were doing to combat disinformation before the war has changed over time, so since, from helping people understand the basics of what they can and can't write on Wikipedia to the presentations you've ended up giving at the European Parliament? Uh, yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, so we in Wikimedia Ukraine were interested in, like, advocacy around this information even before the war started, so we started working on this topic around, like, 2019-ish. Uh, the context was that there was a big like legislative push around uh, uh, Russian fighting Russian disinformation in Ukraine, and we realized that the community also needs some support in this, and we also need to make sure that like there is a good awareness of the Wikimedia model on one side, and there is a good awareness of like disinformation trends in the community on the other side. So we had started developing partnerships with partners, in particular media organizations, uh, like Detector Media or Institute of Mass Information in Ukraine, who are basically some sort of like media watchdogs or independent like media unions who are involved in this topic and with whom we have seen some synergies. And it helped us also to make seminars for the community, to be involved in discussions with partners around these topics. And it was like, not the top priority as a chapter. Well, obviously in terms of advocacy, we also worked on Freedom of Panorama as many of other Eastern European organizations, but that was like after 2022, after the war started, that like went down the priority list. Also because like the legislative initiative was not around it any, anymore, but it became more and more centered around this information. And again, we had a story to tell on one hand, but we also had to learn a lot from how others dealt with it. So uh, we, independently of the war, we already had some plans for big, like, uh, disinformation, fighting disinformation-oriented events, which we were scheduled to start in the end of February 22, which obviously have not started in the shape we wanted because of the Russian invasion, unfortunately, but which, like, gave us already that we have some initiatives, that we opened some doors already. And uh, we ran a series of like seminars for the community with partners where we had external experts explain us how this information works in this context, which helps to, the communities to learn. We also were invited to like events with uh, outside organizations to share our perspective, how Wikimedia movement can fight this information, how we can have like citizen-based models to do this and of course like the peak of this was talking in the European Parliament uh, session not like the main session in the European Parliament but we were still in the European Parliament building taking talking to the members of European Parliament and their staff uh, in December 2022 and then presenting on this topic in um, digital conference Republica in Berlin in 2023 where we were sharing the perspective of like how we as Wikimedians work on fighting disinformation to policymakers. And we had a lot of like interesting questions because on one side, we kind of good 
as Wikipedians, we like to document things, so we also documented disinformation on Wiki. We also worked with external parties to learn about different models of disinformation, how was this, basically how people spread disinformation, because we need to know our like enemy to fight it better. And it also allows to share with the partners, like, you don't need to ban everything. You don't need to be like extremely prescriptive that we can do it together as a community by educating people. We can do it as implementing good policies at good like content filters on our side. And that this approach is basically work because Wikimedia did not turn, Wikimedia projects did have not turned into a garbage. Uh, they successfully curate sources by a team of Wikimedia moderators, patrollers, and so on. So these are the perspectives from our advocacy work on this information about like how we learn from the others, how we share our models, and how we build synergies and collaborations on these topics. And for example, uh, this gives us also a door to like new projects. We are now discussing with a partner a project on uh, reviewing like the most visited articles of Wikipedia, like crucial articles especially around the war topics, around like some historical topics, on like obvious disinformation, on verification by experts, because this is something that our community were, was like long interested in. We did not have a suitable partner. Now we think, we think that we are close to finding a good network of partners, good network of funding to deal with this. And probably we will have a good presentation on this next year if it succeeds. Thank you. You heard it here first. The projects have not turned into garbage. Maybe we can get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much. And we will have time for Q&A. Not all circumstances are that dramatic, for lack, lack of a better term. Um, Patrizia, you mentioned that you were dragged into policy work. But since being dragged into policy work, Wikimedia Chile has taken a leadership role in helping to build an advocacy network of Wikimedians. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about why you chose to focus on advocacy. You know, how did this all get started for you? Uh, yeah, I was drag. <laughs> um, yeah, um, well, Wikimedia Chile exists since 2011. And of course, as any other chapter, we were mainly focused on uh, fueling our community and creating and facilitating the creation of new content for Wikimedia. Uh, yet, in the last few years, we start seeing a certain tendency in our like political space where a lot of regulations around the uses of internet start changing, and that um, that is start concerning us. And even though Chile has very um, important local organizations dedicated to uh, digital rights or, or digital rights advocates and activists, we were seeing that none of them were talking about how these new regulations might affect our model. And of course, because the Wikimedia model, it's very particular. And we rapidly realized that it was not um, I mean, that we had to be the ones to protect and defend our model, that nobody else was going to do it uh, for us. So it was a little bit um, scary at the beginning because it was learning a complete new world, the, the political world, the policy work. The, it's a complete new language and of course it was challenging, but the most challenging but also motivating thing was trying to gain a um, placed in the table where decisions were made around these topics. As any other NGO has the opportunity to participate in those political and, and public policy conversations. And of course, that was uh, an important conversation in our own community. Are we, I mean, are we sure that we want to take this path? And well, we, we took, we took the, we jump, you know, like we took, we decide to, to do that shift. And we also discover very rapidly after doing our first advocacy efforts that um, we, we fail, of course, <laughs> um, that we need to have our community support, not only in Chile, but our wiki world support. 
And that's why we decide to take a certain type of lead or something in creating or fueling, like um, straining this network that was already existing, thanks to the work that you do, Siski, in the Global Advocacy Team. Um, that we need each other to do this. We need not only our like emotional support, but we also need uh, experiences. We also need data. We need, um, yeah, we need the support of our colleagues around the world who are who have been doing this maybe a little bit longer than us, and that's why we. Um, create and we applied and we developed this the first we get advocacy meeting last May and I hope it was like not the first one but not the last one <laughs> and and that was uh, the origin of all of this thank you so much for the work that you've been doing and fueling this uh, emotional support network among other things uh, for the movement. And when I say the movement, I'm talking about Wikimedia, of course, but also many in this room are part of the open movement, the free knowledge movement that we're all part of. And that's really what we're talking about in this room. So let's get a little more down to the tactics. Wikimedia UK is a great example of how this kind of slow burn prep of Wikimedians just putting their head down and doing their programmatic work can help to raise the visibility of Wikimedia as an organization that really has a seat at the table, that has relevant insights to share about important topics like media literacy, for example, and that can then set you up to perhaps influence some more urgent policy discussions. For us, most notably this year, that comes down to our favorite topic, the UK Online Safety Bill, now the UK Online Safety Act tier. It is the biggest campaign we've worked on all year together, the most classic example of, I think, a textbook advocacy initiative in terms of the, the tactics that we applied. And it also dealt with the policy trend of online safety that we're now unfortunately seeing pop up all over the world in Australia, Brazil, Canada, France, at the EU level, and the US, just to name a few. So Lucy, can you please walk us through what this campaign entailed? <laughs> yes, I, I will try. Um, so firstly, for those of you who don't know, the, uh, the UK Online Safety Act was introduced to try and protect people online, but particularly children and young people. Um, and obviously Wikimedia UK and the foundation really strongly supports uh, the idea of children being safe online. Um, but we also felt that the, the, the provisions in the bill were not the way to go about this. We had long-standing concerns um, about the provisions around uh, user verification, content moderation, age gating, that would present uh, a real challenge issue, <laughs> problem for Wikipedia in terms of its community created, curated model, um, its community-led governance, and also the commitment of the foundation to protect uh, user privacy. So um, the, the, the act actually started life back in 2017 as a green paper, um, and then there was a white paper published in 2019. And Wikimedia UK and the foundation, but we were working on this separately at, at that point, uh, we responded to all of those consultations raising our concerns and making it clear that we felt that there were very serious unintended consequences, not just for Wikipedia, but for other non-profit platforms that just did not have the capacity and the resources to comply with these onerous, onerous requirements that clearly been designed with big commercial platforms in mind. And then in January 2023, the bill was introduced to the House of Lords. And in the UK parliamentary system, it's in the House of Lords that the really detailed scrutiny takes place. So that's the point at which our advocacy efforts really went up a gear. And by this point, Wikimedia UK and Wikimedia Foundation were working very closely together to align um, on a campaign. Um, so we, we worked with the Wikimedia UK, uh, mainly me, <laughs> worked with the global advocacy team at the foundation, but also the legal teams, um, who, without which actually the work that we did really wouldn't have been possible in quite the same way, um, and also the, the media teams. Um, and the approach initially was to look at this incredibly complex, heavy 300-page bill and say, what are the really egregious elements for our movement? and to draft changes to the bill. Um, we then did a targeted email campaign to about 60 peers that we'd identified as being of high priority. 
We had follow-up meetings with peers that shared our concerns, but we also held briefing meetings with people um, where we were trying to change their mind and advocate for our position. So we met with government ministers, government departments, the regulator Ofcom. We were invited to brief the Labour front bench in the House of Lords. And um, owing to all of those efforts, we were able to secure sponsors for our changes, which are called amendments. So those amendments were then debated during what's called the committee stage in the House of Lords, which confusingly is not a committee, but involves the whole House. <laughs> so that's where the detailed line-by-line -line scrutiny takes place. And it became clear from that, that actually, and these private meetings with government ministers, that we really needed to change tack for the next stage. So we decided that instead of presenting 10 or so amendments which are addressing individual problematic areas of the bill, that we would instead focus on just one amendment, which was calling for an exception to, uh, for public interest po um, projects, so that the law would not apply to Wikipedia and other similar non-profit um, spaces. So um, we, we then went to the report stage. There are about seven different stages of the, of, um, uh, the passage of a bill through each of the houses in the UK system. Um, the report stage was where we presented this amendment, well, our, the, our sp sponsoring peers presented this amendment. And I want to share a few quotes from, uh, that are on the public record from members of the House, because I think it's really clear that there was cross-party support for some kind of exception for projects like Wikipedia. So, um, and I'm not, obviously not going to remember these completely, so I'm just going to read them to you. So, Baroness Stowell, Conservative front bench peer, I have been very much persuaded by the various correspondence that I have received from me, <laughs> which often uses Wikipedia as the example to illustrate the problem. We must make sure that there is a way of appropriately excluding organisations that should not be subject to these various regulations because they're not designed for them. Lord Clement Jones, who was the Liberal Democrats um, spokesperson for the digital economy at the time, all of us are Wikipedia users. We all value the service. I particularly appreciated what was said by the noble Baroness Lady Kidron. Wikipedia does not push its content at us. It is not algorithmically based. And it's worth noting that Baroness Kidron, who spoke really passionately on Wikipedia's behalf, is actually the chair of the Five Rights Foundation, which is a, a key child safety organization that was also lobbying heavily for the online safety bill. So we had supporters in the house. And Baroness Harding, another conservative, said, there is unanimity of desire here to make sure that organizations such as Wikipedia and StreetMap are not captured. Reader, <laughs> the unanimity of desire did not result in a softening of position from the government. Um, so as a result of this, Wikimedia UK and the Wikimedia Foundation decided to launch an open letter. Um, at this point, we had been very much focused on parliamentarians in our advocacy. We had also generated quite a bit of media coverage um, in uh, newspapers such as The Telegraph, The Guardian, and on the BBC. Um, but this is where we're really trying to galvanise the public, but also allied and partner organisations. And the, the letter essentially repeated what we had said in private, which was we, we felt very strongly that there should be a public, sorry, that there should be an exception to the law for public interest projects. And the letter was signed by over 800 individuals and organisations, including Creative Commons, Flickr Foundation, the Heritage Alliance, Liberty and Open Rights Groups, among many others. Unfortunately, <laughs> the Online Safety Act, as, as Siski alluded to earlier, did pass into law with most of the troubling elements still intact. It became very clear um, that whilst I think it's fair to say that there were civil servants who were sympathetic to our calls, um, the direction of travel in terms of the government of the day was that they wanted to make the bill really wide in scope and that the, um, the sort of particularity and the secondary legislation would all fall on the, the regulator Ofcom. We felt very strongly that you cannot rely on a regulator to enforce the will of the House and that you know, Wikipedia should have been protected in law. Um, unfortunately, we, we failed to make that change. What we did do, though, is we really increased the profile of Wikimedia UK among policymakers, the media and the general public. But more importantly, we I think we created a much better understanding of Wikipedia's model, the community governance and content creation model, um, amongst again, amongst policymakers um, and in the media. And the focus now has shifted to working with the regulator Ofcom, and this is where the Wikimedia Foundation is really doing all of the heavy lifting, um, to ensure that the law's implementation acknowledges Wikipedia's value acknowledges 
its uniqueness that's been recognised by members of the House of Lords, and that's on the public record, and really safeguards its unique collaborative model. Um, so it's a hugely varied, um, diverse, interesting experience. We didn't make the change that we wanted to, but I think we did learn a lot along the way. And I might also add that I think it also helped us gain a few new friends in the UK among civil society because perhaps Wikimedia UK, I don't know historically if you guys worked a lot with anti-surveillance civil society groups, but those are certainly the ones that we were able to meet with regularly, Lucy and I, um, as part of a coalition that was really essential to just basic information exchange because as most of us in this room can appreciate, just staying on top of the information that you need to know of like when all these different stages are taking place yeah, yeah. and who might be open to being influenced all relies on back, back channels, personal connections that we just maybe don't have, but others who are in civil society do have. Yeah, thank you, I meant to add that, so that's a good addition. <laughs> Working with parliamentarians is one thing. Working with the actual officials or civil servants, as Lucy alluded to, who are stuck writing the law is another, and something that Wikimedia Sweden has experience with. So Eric, last but certainly not least, before we move on to questions. What are some of the insights that you've accumulated over the years working with civil servants who are really doing the drafting? And based on that experience, perhaps you can share some advice that you have for Wikimedians who are trying to influence policy on that really uh, tactical level. I, I just want to start by acknowledging how important the work that Lucy and Wikimedia UK has done on the online safety bill, because I think that we see similar proposals just popping up in so many countries at the same time. And even though maybe you didn't succeed to the extent that you wanted to, I think that there's a lot that we can learn as Wikimedians also from the work that Wikimedia UK did. Thank you. Um, but I, I think maybe Wikimedia Sweden started in a, in a position slightly similar to, to Patricia and Wikimedia Chile. Like, we just wanted to do our wiki work, you know, like all of us are doing, editing Wikipedia, adding photos to Wikimedia Commons and organize, organizing campaigns and collaborations and everything. But then, very unfortunately, we, we lost uh, a case in the Swedish Supreme Court uh, around freedom of panorama, uh, one of our favorite uh, um, question, um, And this kind of catapulted us to the to the to the table we needed to to start like uh, patricia said dragged we were just kind of thrown into the room <laughs> like uh, all of a sudden everyone wants to know our position everyone wants to know what does this actually mean for wikimedia what effect does it have on wikipedia uh, this was i think eight years ago um, and we quite rapidly needed to develop a strategy for how to change how to change the law or how so that the the outcome from the supreme court would be changed but also to start to do advocacy in general because if if we could lose a case around freedom of panorama there's for sure other areas where we can lose uh, court cases as well we need to build a, a long-term advocacy strategy um for for quite a few years we struggled to to, to understand how to do this in a, in a in a good way uh, we met with members of the parliament we met with uh, with the politicians at different levels um but Around the same time, there was a, quite a large amount of court cases from the Supreme Court that turned out to be very detrimental for openness altogether. There was a very weird Supreme Court case around press uh, information, the, the opportunity for the press to share content widely on on uh, on the on internet, like for, for the news reporting. There was uh, another qu qu quite a few different issues, five or six court cases that we that we. Um, identified that caused big problem for the for the opportunity to share information and content freely online uh, and this is also something that the the government started to realize so we had several meetings with the uh, with the um, uh, with the department of law that's responsible for for copyright and ip in in sweden uh, and said that these are a few things that need to be changed like the the outcome of the of the courts create a situation which doesn't work in an in an online environment uh, and for some reason, eventually, they, they actually listen to our concerns. So what happens in Sweden when you want to change the law? I know this looks very different in many different countries. Lucy explained what, what the process looks like in the UK. But in, in Sweden, a law is changed by the government appointing a committee. Uh, and this committee is mandata mandated to propose uh, a, a reform of the legislation. Then, then the government kind of takes this proposal back and, and puts it into a, into a bill. 
So they, they appointed a committee of, of 10 lawyers and me uh, that was to meet for, for two years and, and propose a complete revision of the uh, chapter of exceptions and limitations in copyright in the Swedish copyright law. And I don't know how, much, how copyright nerdy everyone in this room is, but exceptions and, and limitations in the copyright law is pretty much what, what, what opens up for the flexibility that is needed for platforms like Wikimedia to be able to, to run. Uh, so we had an opportunity for two years to actually talk about some of the most important topics uh, to our heart, like exceptions and limitations uh, in the Swedish copyright law. And this was a huge opportunity and also very scary. I, I'm not sure if anyone in this room is a lawyer. Maybe they are, and lawyers can be fantastic people. But they also have a way of talking that I, I was not accustomed to. I, I uh, felt that it took quite a few months to actually understand how to talk with lawyers in a professional uh, capacity, especially since I'm not a lawyer myself. But a few... <laughs> none of us are... Uh, are None of us here are lawyers, no? I, I think that's typically the case. Like, we, uh, we uh, fill an important vacuum in that, in that sense. But I, I want to say, like, a few of the takeaways that I've had from actually, you know, working with the civil servants and, uh, and trying to, to change the way that the law is drafted. And, and one thing that may, might be the hardest is that you need to know what to influence. You need to know, really, you really, you need to have practical ideas of how you want the law to be changed. Like when you make political advocacy towards members of the parliament or, or in the media, you can say, we want more openness, we want more flexibility, we want better opportunities for Wikipedia to be run. But when you're in the room with the civil servants, like that doesn't convince them. They want to know exactly like which paragraph which part of the paragraph, which word in this part of the paragraph is supposed to be changed. So you need, you need, you need to know what to influence and, and in, a, in a concrete way. Uh, as I'm not a lawyer, I, I don't have the opportunity to, to propose the legal wording. That, that's something that we, that we thankfully have lawyers for. But what I do have is practical examples. I can bring so many practical examples of where the law makes it difficult for Wikipedia to run and also for everyone that is kind of in the in the environment that is needed for for free knowledge to be to be shared like i worked a lot with researchers that have a lot of practical examples of how they can share data how 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 the law makes it hard or impossible for them to to collaborate across borders you know uh, just gather practical examples because the 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 civil servants they don't want to hear we want more openness but if i can present a practical example like, they don't want to create a law that has practical issues in the law. Like, if I can say this is actually a big problem and it's caused by the way in which this is worded, then my experience is that they typically actually start to, to listen. So you need to identify what you want to influence and you need to have practical examples of why the, the, the current wording causes a lot of problems. And then obviously you need to build relations and networks. You, have, you need to have relationships with the, with the civil servants. Like if they have an issue with the research bill, then like you need to have, like it's good if you have a, a good relationship enough that you are the one that they call when they want to understand what this, what this uh, law will have as, as impact. But you also need to have relationships and, and networks with other uh, with other organizations, other associations, and sometimes it might be the ones that you're friends with, sometimes it might be with the uh, with enemies on the other side of the table, like Lucy has explained with the organization who, whose name I for, forgot, the Children Safety... Oh, Five Rights. Five Rights. Yeah. Um, but also, like, I mean, we were in the same room as the um, CMOs, like the, the, the copyright holder, the rights holder representatives, and we typically have very different views on how to do this. But if we are supposed to come up with a, a new proposal, then we also need to have some kind of conversation with the, with the rights holder representatives. And can we find like a middle ground? Is there something that they can accept and that we can accept as well? So when you, when you end up in the room with the civil servants, you also need to have more prag pragmatism. Practical examples, um, know what to influence, and some pragmatism that might be difficult for uh, like uh, us as Wikimedians sometimes. For me, it's really difficult. But you, but you need to have like an understanding that there is. Uh, you need to let some things go in in the negotiations. 
Um, and I think that for us, like to, to close this off, it really worked to show uh, willingness to, to collaborate, to show pragmatism, because they had expected like a movement of activists to come into the into into the room. They thought that we, we were like I I was to be the the hard one, the tricky one, the one just caused troubles. But you know, showing that you know we really want to solve those practical issues. It's not about reforming everything at once, but we have a few issues that we want you guys to solve. I think that also that 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 pragmatism made the civil servants really interested in, in listening. So now we have a proposal on the table in a few in a few months and it has some good things and some bad things uh, as as always and also I think is an outcome really good relationships with civil servants at the at the departments of law and education and, and culture that are the ones that are important for our work. I'd warrant to say that pragmatism is also so much more effective because you're making very pragmatic arguments, not so that you can make more money or your platform can make more money, but so that you and the government can maximize the public interest somehow or serve the public good better somehow. And that probably resonates a little more strongly. I'm going to change my last question to you guys here. We're going to do a really quick lightning round, 30 second answer, but you're all smart and caffeinated. So I believe in you. If there were one policy discussion that you could see Wikimedia really impacting in a meaningful way in the next one or two years, that could be a national legislation, it could be something related to UNESCO or the GDC, what would it be and why? And we'll go in reverse order. So Lucy, we're starting with you. Uh, so the UK has a new government, um, secret hurrah. <laughs> Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, the new Labour government doesn't yet seem very focused on technology, um, implications of AI. It's just pulled funding for a supercomputer, I think Cambridge University. Um, and there are bigger problems going on right now in the UK, and I understand that. But I think that there needs to be some really serious policy discussions over the next year or so um, about how Labour sees uh, future technological developments, responsible AI, um, regulation, and I'd really love Wikimedia to be part of those. Uh, yes, so speaking about discussions that would happen worldwide, I would expect to be some discussions about content moderation, that this topic so far was a bit under the radar, but we expect that like people would try to force Wikimedia to like more proactively moderate content because there are already some signs that this is happening, that they want like us to implement some sort of pre-moderation before the content goes live. Hasn't happened yet, but we would need to defend our model. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. Uh, we already had that discussion in Chile, platform regulation. We, as Wikimedia Chile, with the support of the Global Advocacy Team, participated in the conversation. We managed to contained what was happening there, but at the same time, there are three or four different uh, law projects that are, for now, sleeping on the parliament, but they're going to wake up eventually. Um, and platform regulation and misinformation, those are the topics that are very present in, the lo in my local context. Maybe this is a wishful thinking. I wish that Wikimedia could participate to try to make the best out of those conversations. No, I totally agree on the content moderation part. I also think that we have an important like role to fill in the global conversations on artificial intelligence because we know that Wikipedia is one of the most or at least very well used sources for training the the large AI models um, and that also gives us a lot of a lot of legitimacy to actually speak how how should this be good done in a good way and I think like we are often perceived as a media organization I don't think maybe we perceive of us, ourselves as a media organization but most other media organizations uh, have kind of requested opt out so they don't want their materials to be used do we want our material to be used for training AI if so, then that's you know that's a strong message or a signal that I think people will, in the world want to hear. And now I see that Siski kind of signals that time is running out, so I'll hand over to Siski. Thank you. We do have. We're going to start our Q and A. We have our first question online, and Eric, I'm going to punt this to you. Does Wikimedia also promote open source and open data policies for the public interest? 
Yes, I think indeed. Uh, I think there will be even a few sessions here during Wikimania that talks open access, open science, open policies in general. Do you want to plug your sessions that are coming up? <laughs> I didn't want to name my own sessions, but there is a good one on Friday coming up. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's there's others from our Creative Commons, etc. friends in the room um, who have a lot of a lot of sessions on that topic specifically, and the foundation and affiliates certainly support that kind of work as well. Questions in the room? This is something that has been... <laughs> I'm fine with uncomfortable silence. Oh. We know we'll get one eventually, and it's always Mehman. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's for you, Lucy. Uh, you said that uh, they put some in, like some exception in the bill that uh, it will not apply for the public interest organization, etc. But uh, is, is there any like um, specific uh, like term how uh, like which organization it's not apply or is just wording in the bill? So the the wording that we presented did not make it into the bill. Um, so, one of the lawyers at the foundation drafted wording which would um, provide for an exception for public interest projects and I can't remember the exact wording but it was obviously care very carefully drafted. Also, um, Phil produced something that could accompany that which would enable the regulator to essentially um, say to an organization, no, you're abusing, you're exploiting that exception, and so the law now applies to you, um, so, so to avoid any loopholes. So, and that's quite a, a common thing that's happened in various pieces of law around the world. Um, we presented the amendment alongside with the wording that we felt should sit there um, as, a, as a safeguard against um, abuse or exploitation. But um, whilst there was a lot of support from across members of the House of Lords for an exception um, for a non-profit public interest, educational purposes, that was not passed. Um, the, the government um, refused to, to support it. Hi, Anne-Sophie from Wikimedia Germany. I work in education policy and my question is just, you talked about a first meeting of advocacy people, so maybe what kind of um, meetings are there in the future? How can we connect? Great, this what question was not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I have a session about that on Friday, actually. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, on um, Friday or Saturday? Oh, well, uh, I don't remember exactly, <laughs> but it's a session where I'm going to share the main outcomes of that first meeting. Um, we call it the first meeting, even though probably it's not like the really the first, but it's the first action to create this network or of wiki advocates and also some regional, re, I'm sorry, regional digital advocates. Um, Federique was there. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity. We learned a lot, not only about the tendencies of the things that we are discussing in our different context, but also the needs of our wiki, communi wiki advocacy community. And there's also a document that we produce as Wikimedia Chile that um, kind of explained the whole process and the outcomes. And we are going to talk about more about that on Friday or Saturday. <laughs> Thank you. So since the UK online safety bill has been copied and pasted into US legislation. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, you don't have to apologize. Um, the, uh, yeah, what, what, what's the team thinking about that? What are I, cause I, I saw EFF's name a lot in the last few months around that. Didn't see Wikimedia's, is that going to change in the next legislative session or? The VP of Global Advocacy for the Wikimedia Foundation is sitting here, so I'm not going to commit us to anything, but what I can say, and I'll pass it to Rebecca, is certainly we're monitoring this and we're trying to think of a way that we can more 
it feels like playing whack-a-mole is the term we've been using on the team to address exactly this copying pasting effect that's happening and we want to think of how we can start to more strategically respond to all of these i imagine we will be doing something in the u.s rebecca you are the so, authority yeah on the kids online safety act i assume that's what you're talking about uh it passed the senate it's expected to die in the house um just to get technical uh, this this time around and where it goes in the future depends on an election coming up but um but the kids online safety act will not affect wikipedia there there's ba basically it's not quite as broad um as the online safety bill uh the the wikimedia projects won't be directly affected which is one reason why we haven't been as visible because our team is small and we've been having to prioritize stuff that directly affects Wikimedians and the Wikimedia projects. So, so that kind of gets first on the plate and we're advocating globally. So, so that's, but we're monitoring it very closely. We've, we've been involved with coalitions that relate to it, but we haven't been leading. You know, we, we kind of pick and choose where we join and where we lead. And um, we tend to lead on stuff that affects Wikimedians and the projects directly. And EFF was a close partner in the coalition work we were doing in the UK. So to wrap this up, to answer everybody's questions, the answer is come to the relevant session later at Wikimania. There is also a really great workshop we'll be running on child's rights. So it would be great to have allied partners in that room so it's not just a Wikimedia-centric conversation because it is something that is very important to the open movement in general, I'd say. Please, a big round of applause to our speakers. And thank you, everybody, for your attention.